This week on the WriterCon podcast. Everyone always says you need to read. And I do think that's true, but I would add, you need to read across many, many genres. Like just read across the board. You will learn something from each genre. For example, I love to read poetry. I can't write it. But learning how to be that concise with words, yeah, how they yeah. sound together, how to convey an emotion with five words or less, very handy when writing suspense. So read a lot and read all over the place. Welcome to WriterCon, a gathering place for writers to share their knowledge about writing and the writing world. Your hosts are William Bernhardt, best-selling novelist and author of the Red Sneaker Books on Writing, and Renee Gutteridge, best-selling author of over 30 novels and screenplays. Hey there, writers. This is a very special episode of the podcast because it features an interview with our WriterCon Sunday keynote speaker, Lisa Gardner, one of the most successful thriller writers, in fact, one of the most successful writers, period, on the face of the planet. Of course, we previously interviewed Susan Meisner and Tosca Lee, both major writers who will also be delivering addresses at the conference. So, Renee, at this point, we have been doing this conference for a while, and we've seen a lot of keynotes. Mm -hmm. Do you have one in particular that sticks out in your mind? You know, I love having Don Moss. Um, He, you know, I've followed him for a long time. I consider him like one of my teachers. I've read his books. I've gone to his workshops. So to have him um, come uh, was wonderful. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it was one of those awkward moments when you feel like you know somebody better than they know you. you (laughs) You're just like, you've you've taught me so much. And they're like, thank you, ma'am. But it, it, it was really great to have him. So yeah, yeah. I agree. That was terrific. Well, for that matter, last year's uh, Sunday keynote, Robert Dagoni gave, I thought the best inspirational Mm -hmm. get out there and write talk I've ever had. But I think my absolute all-time favorite was Dan Millman. You remember, at this point, he's over 70, and he started his speech by doing a handstand <laughs> on one of those crummy little plastic chairs that they had in the conference room. Of course, he is a former world-class gymnast, but man, yeah. he still got it. I was impressed. <laughs> Jesse, what about you? Do you have a favorite WriterCon moment? Well, mostly it's just like watching as a non-writer, right? Watching, Mm -hmm. there's always one speaker who gives a sort of different or new piece of advice and watching that like click with somebody in the audience who I've been watching, like hear all of the normal, you know, write every day, whatnot, like finally connect with, with a speaker on like what has been blocking them or troubling them in their writing journey, like seeing that connect and like seeing their eyes open a little bit and like mm-hmm. see the excitement return. Like I, I always enjoy that. Cause like, I'm like that person's life just changed just yeah. then. I'm like, good. Oh, that's great. All right. Our interview today, as I've said, is with Lisa Gardner, a number one New York times bestselling novelist. She says she began her career in food service. I think that means she was waiting tables. But according to her, after catching her hair on fire several times, she decided to take the hint and focus on her writing. She says she's a self-described research junkie, and she transferred her interest in police procedure and criminal minds into a streak of internationally acclaimed novels. She's been published in more than 30 countries. She's had four books become movies. That's At the Midnight Hour, The Perfect Husband, The Survivors Club, and Hyde. And she's been on television repeatedly. Her novel, The Neighbor, won the best hardcover novel from ITW, the International Thriller Writers, and has you know, a former board member of that group, I can tell you that is a serious big deal. That's an award everybody wants. She's won the Grand Prix de l'Actrice de l I'm sure I mispronounced that, <laughs> awarded in France. She's got the Daphne du Maurier Award uh, for a book called The Other Daughter. And she got a, the Silver Bullet Award from ITW for her work on behalf of at-risk children and the Humane Society. So much to talk about. And we will talk to Lisa 
right after this news segment. Jesse, take us away. First news item, there is a new Harlequin imprint, which has been directly inspired by TikTok. These are romances, of course, but this new line, which is called Afterglow, will be targeting the under 35 romance reader. They're building on TikTok's hashtag spicy talk content, which, in case you didn't know, is for spicy romances, which have become a boom industry this year. Spicy romance, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I think that falls somewhere between your typical category romance and erotica, uh, sort of straddling in the middle. But anyway, they're going to release two trade paper paperback titles a month starting in January. The editor, Stacy Boyd, says, and I quote, Afterglow is that feeling after a beautiful moment, achievement, or experience. It takes readers to the happy part of life. It's timeless, positive, and rings true for the characters in these books, end quote. I don't know. We know that the romance sector is the most popular genre by a significant margin. Renee, should we all just give up and start writing romance novels? No. No. <laughs> okay that was direct i like that. <laughs> that that's my final answer is, is that all that's all <laughs> can you expand <laughs> i mean i think i'd be really bad at it because even my wife doesn't think i'm very romantic but i'm sure you could pull it off right i i, I once wrote uh, a romance and uh my editor had to address the fact that it was not romancy enough with a letter to me. And to also, she suggested I lean into the wisdom of my co-writer, a male, uh, who had written the screenplay and see if I could get any tips from him. So, oh, wow. yeah, I don't think I'm the one to write uh, the next romance. And, you know, right. it's okay to have a bustling genre but not everybody reads that so we've got to we got to serve the other readers right romance can't be more than what 56 percent of <laughs> or something like that of all genre fiction it's hard and, to believe it's that big but anyway okay go ahead. yeah and this spicy romance i i heard about that for the first time on the writer con cruise we had of course an ag agent with us amy brewer who is wonderful and she uh, started talking and she could even go into some of the like sub sub categories and boy, it was an eye opener. Yeah. And, and it all is due to TikTok. Jesse, how can TikTok be so influential? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's very frustrating. No, I, that's Renee's answer. You're I know, supposed to. I know. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in Renee's camp here. Like, um, I will say the uh, Is It Spicy became one of my favorite uh, inside jokes of that cruise, though, because I would just ask everybody, but is it spicy? So, You um, think this is going to last? Is TikTok or BookTok going to hang? Who, is it going to be replaced by threads? I don't know. What, well, what probably not, since apparently the threads engagement dropped off dramatically after it launched. By 50% or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I keep waiting for TikTok to be, be made illegal, and it keeps surviving. So who knows? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. They keep saying, but not yeah. doing. I mean, I think... I think eventually people will figure out what it is about TikTok that allows for this kind of engagement and we'll be able to replicate that in other mm -hmm. forms. But until then, apparently it's TikTok. So, yeah. you know, if you're trying to get your book out there, find someone who knows how to make TikToks. It's not me. So, okay. ask, at, uh, since, since it hasn't come up in this episode, episode yet, ask ChatGPT how to make a <laughs> successful TikTok for your book. <laughs> well, as it happens, that's exactly where we're going ah. with news story number two. We reported, well, we reported several weeks, but last week we talked about the open letter from authors saying basically stop stealing our stuff. Uh, some authors have filed a class action lawsuit, but just a few days ago we heard that the Associated Press has actually struck a deal with one of these companies, OpenAI. 
It's a two-year agreement to share access to AP's news content dating back to 1985. That's a huge amount of content. And in exchange, AP gets, you think I'm going to say money, but no, they get access to OpenAI's technology and product expertise. Nobody's exactly sure what they that means, but we assume they're getting something. Maybe this shouldn't be surprising because historically the Associated Press was one of the first major national news organizations to use automation technology in its news reports. They for About a decade ago, they started automating first corporate earnings reports and it just grew from there, local sporting events, and now they're using automation in some parts of the news gathering and production process. Renee, you think this is a step forward for authors and AI? I don't know. I, I don't even know how. I have no idea. Th there this it is. is so we weird. were waiting to hear you <laughs> say. Well, I have no idea. Uh, well, I didn't. I'm glad I'm. I'm not the only one that doesn't understand exactly no. what the AP is getting. But um, y yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate because honestly, like the AP was always like who you look to to check the news right. <laughs> you, to you get know the I mean? real were, deal to get yeah. the real deal so i mean it's like there's they're kind of selling out in a sense it feels like but i don't exactly understand it all so it's hard to know like how much is ai how much is human how many reporters are involved but the the ap was always the gold standard in my book and mm -hmm. so i i don't understand what this all means so yeah, well, I, I mean, they're trying to get them to stop scraping the internet and authors work to feed their program. But I don't know, Jesse, will this end open AI data scraping? I mean, no, but <laughs> right. um, I, I will say the one good thing about a partnership with the, a the AP with, with, with AP is like, I do trust AP to not like abuse this and mm. to use it well. Um, it would be nice to know what they're actually getting from it, but there are ways that AI systems can help us, you know, automate and improve and speed up delivery of news. Maybe, I don't know, if, listen, OpenAI, if you're listening, I know you're listening because you're scraping everything. Like, <laughs> if, They'll listen to the transcript yeah. when it's posted. Oh, OpenAI, I'm talking to you directly here. You can come up with a, with a tool to help us, like, figure out what news is real and what news is fake. That's can, what we need. You can really improve your PR with us content creators slash people you're stealing things from. So, we don't need faster news. We yeah. need accurate news. Yes. yes. Ooh, that's a tagline for something. Can, can we have a tagline of the podcast <laughs> right. now? Um, yeah, yeah, I don't think that's where the AI money is. No. But that, wouldn't that be nice? Well, and here's the thing. No one's, maybe someone has reported on this and I haven't seen it, but how are these AI people making money is my question. Because it costs a lot of money to come up with these models and mm -hmm. these, you know, um, whatever you want to call them, uh, massive computers. And no one, like ChatGPT will charge you, but they also mm -hmm. most people use the free version. So mm -hmm. where is the money coming from? Well, that's eventually going to change, don't you think? Eventually, they're going to start charging people for that's this. That's right. They're going to get you hooked where you can't think anymore, and you have to put everything into chat GPT to get an answer, and then they're going to charge you fourteen ninety nine a month, <laughs> right. and your brain has stopped working, and you're going to be completely dependent on it. <laughs> like, what, what am I having for breakfast today? I tell me. <laughs> wow. It's the Forbidden Project all over again. <laughs> All right, Jesse, on that happy note, uh, let's get out of the news, cue up the music. Let's talk to Lisa Gardner. Lisa Gardner, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Oh, it's great to have you. Okay, we have a traditional first question. If you could offer writers one piece of advice, what would it be? Ooh, ooh, I got this one. Okay. okay. Everyone always says you need to read. And I do think that's true, but I would add, you need to read across many, many genres. Like just read across the board. You will learn something from each 
genre. For example, I love to read poetry. I can't write it. But learning how to be that concise with words, yeah, how okay. they sound together, how to convey an emotion with five words or less, very handy when writing suspense. So read yeah. a lot and read all over the place. Yeah, every word counts, but they've got to be the right words, right? <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> well, congratulations on the publication of your most recent book, One Step Too Far. Tell us about it. Um, One Te Step Too Far is the second book in the Frankie Elkin series. She's like an everyday average person who's obsessed with solving missing persons cold cases. In this case, it brings her to the mountains of Wyoming, where a young man has gone missing. She joins the search team, and I call it um, Agatha Christie Goes for a Hike. It's basically, <laughs> and then there were none set in, you know, the far out back of Wyoming. <laughs> that is fantastic. So where did the idea for this book come from? You know, it's interesting. I'm an avid hiker. I live in the mountains of New Hampshire and all of my 30 plus years, I've just never written about hiking, but there was a really great article that came out about the number of people that go missing each year on our national public lands, like our national forests. Yeah. And these are the kinds of cases that fall through the cracks, so to speak. So they're perfect for Frankie Elkin. You know, when someone goes missing in the woods, it's a volunteer effort to find them. And there'll be a ton of volunteers, hundreds of people and dog handlers, drone operators, ATV guides. And a lot of the community goes into this and really tries very hard. But once you read a certain threshold of time, when it looks like you probably will not get positive results, these volunteers have to get back to their everyday life. So slowly but surely, they all fade away. And for the family of the missing, there's no closure. And they still don't know what happened out in the woods. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That is intriguing. Wow, I'm sold. I'm going to have to read this book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, before we go any further, I want to thank you up front for coming to WriterCon and giving the keynote speech I know how busy you are, so I, I, you must enjoy conferences at least a little bit or you wouldn't be doing it, right? Oh, I'm very excited. And I'm very excited for WriterCon. That's one of my favorite kinds of conferences because, you know, we get to be in the company of our own kind. You know, other people who want to argue about point of view and, you know, hear voices in their head and, you know, possibly, you know, spend a great deal of time thinking about how to get away with murder and you know, <laughs> haven't been arrested yet. So it's all good stuff. I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it tremendously. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> We are so excited here, and I am, I cannot wait to meet you. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, I can't wait. Thank you. And I always learn something. There's never any moment in this industry oh, yes. where okay. you know what you're doing. Congratulations on your seven novels. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I, um, I heard that you actually started your career in the food service industry. <laughs> is that right? What happened It's there? in our official bio. It must be yes. true. So. Yes, it, it is a, a sad, sad story. So I was very lucky in that I wrote my first book when I was 17. And of course, writing during the day. That's yeah. like you completed it, like started, yeah. completed. Oh, wow. That's yeah, fantastic. it's a great example of sometimes it's best not to know any better. I mean, I lived yeah. in Oregon. I never met an editor, an agent, an author. I didn't know what could or couldn't be done. So I'm ambitiously writing during the day. Need to make money, of course. Yeah. So I was waitressing at night. And okay. uh, I, I, I will assure you, I was the world's worst waitress. Uh, one of our appetizers was something called flaming saganaki, which is this cheese. It's wow. deep fried. And then you take it out to the table and you pour... I don't know, brandy or something on it and you torch it except you know this was the early 90s and there was a lot of aquanet and when i went to torch it my hair oh, just no. <laughs> oh, no. so i i flipped the flaming cheese onto the ground and caught the carpet on fire i did have the good sense to beat it out and i decided um waitressing was probably not a good job for me <laughs> and really needed the book thing to work out no yeah. judgment no judgment from me i've had a lot of had a lot of different jobs myself, so. You may be the only writer in history for whom writing was a safer choice than <laughs> your other job. Well said, well said. And speaking of things I've never seen in anybody else's bio ever, is it true you wrote and, and sold your first book while you were still in school, in college? 
I well, I did. Um, so I actually wrote the first book right before I went to college and I didn't know what to do with it because again, I didn't know anyone who right. in the industry. So I just put the manuscript under my bed because you know, what else are you going to do? <laughs> I went off to college back East to the university of Pennsylvania. And when people said, you know, what did you do this summer? I'm like, Oh, I wrote a book. <laughs> and at a certain point, people like, you should try, you should try to do something with it. And, you know, I rewrote it a couple of times. I then I followed, we had books back then, you know, how to write and publish a novel, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, no Google, but uh, followed the instructions. And I got very lucky. The publisher I reached out to, the editor actually recognized my address as the dorms at Penn because she went there Aww. too. So she, you know, gave the manuscript to read and, you know, a mere two years in revision work later, <laughs> it all worked out. <laughs> Thank you for saying that, because I think it's important that um, first time writers hear about what a very lengthy revision process that first novel might initially take as we are. Um, learning that process. So thank you for that. Yes. I got a 20 page single spaced revision letter. I actually cried. Wow. But I, I learned a lot and I ate a lot of brownies. Good for you. <laughs> so I got to ask, I hear you've, you host okay, a- Okay, stop, let's pause. Jesse, <laughs> you're gonna have to cut this out. Um, Mustafer <laughs> has broken in. Can you set him outside the door and really shut the door this time? <laughs> Oh, poor renegade I, I, I will always I mean, make, cut, I always make cuts for on the podcast, oh, but that'll make great outtake footage. Oh, yeah, I'm <laughs> <say that. laughs> the cats of Ryder Cup. Yeah, right. that's right. I yeah, like that. There we go. Okay. Well, well, what's gonna make a great edit is like I'm gonna disappear right when you guys start again, so that's what I'll know exactly when to make the, the cut. So, all right. Okay, like take it from that last question, I think, Laura. Yes. Okay. So I need to know more about this. I hear that you host an online contest called Kill a Friend, Mame a Buddy. Am I getting <laughs> yes. that right? What is that about? So when I set up my website many, many moons ago, my agent was like, you need to offer a reader something they can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I'm like, huh, you know, the books, but of course they can get the books many places. And I'm like, well, I can offer them the opportunity to die. <laughs> mm. Possible. In my very first thriller, The Perfect Husband, I was working then as a business consultant and I was very frustrated. So uh, many, many of the bosses who made me work late and weekends um, possibly died in the making of The Perfect Husband. And I found that very therapeutic. I thought yeah, other yeah, people yeah. might as well. <laughs> That's a nice, healthy way to get rid of that, yes. It's been a lot of fun. There's people who nominate themselves. So yes, you go to the website. Very it's nice. an easy enough thing to do. Um, you can only nominate yourself once, but other people can. Last year's winner, okay. like she had 30 members of her family all submitting okay. her name. Um, it's meant to be a lot of fun. Uh, I, one year it was a wife who was, she said it was her husband. I'm like, um, I don't want to end up in court over this. <laughs> like, oh, no, no, he's really excited. He's hoping he's he can be a badass. And I'm like, Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, love so. I love it. That's terrific. Your books are called or described as psychological thrillers, but also sometimes I've seen some of them called romantic suspense. Uh, don't you have someone telling you? I mean, I get the advice, pick a genre and stick with it. Do you not hear that so much? Or how are you juggling that? Well, I don't like to overthink the labels, I'll be honest. I'm always writing suspense. Mm -hmm. So there's always going to be some kind of crime, but I've also been around 30 years. So like when I first started out, it was the FBI profilers. So it was the straight up, you know, incredibly violent thriller. But, you know, 10 years of that later, I got more into domestic suspense, which I think has a tendency to be a lot more psychological, you know, mm -hmm. wondering about the person you think you love most in the world, but maybe now you should fear the most. Um, some books, I think a relationship makes a great deal of sense. And so there's a romantic element. Some books, it's not right for that. I, you, you're right. You have to be somewhat consistent within a genre. But I think suspense is a big enough umbrella 
there's plenty of space to move around within that umbrella. You know, series characters and series books are very popular. In fact, I think I'm speaking on this subject at WriterCon now that I think <laughs> about it, but it should be you because you've got, am I right, like five different series? Uh, at I'm, some, uh, I'm terribly confused on the issue. You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> what draws you to that kind of fiction? You know, I'm the non-series series writer. I never planned any of them. So I'm never sure if I'm the best or worst person to talk about this. Um, the Perfect Husband, my first breakout thriller, that book that 10 years later made me, you know, an overnight success, had an FBI profiler in it because, you know, it's a serial killer book. Well, at the end of that, I wrote a different standalone book. But then my publisher came back to me and they're like, you know, everyone likes that Pierce Quincy. Maybe you could do another Pierce Quincy book. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, I think I could. I have an idea that would work. And then it's like, oh, well, maybe I could do one more. I have an idea that works. But then I came up with a crime that would actually be a Boston cop. So I left him behind and I did Detective Dee Dee Warren, except then I had an idea that needed an FBI profiler. <laughs> and you get the gist of how this all worked out. So none of them are actually published consecutively. You know, right. that would be way too simple for me or my readers, but I think it's worked it's out. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to write books where you will love the characters and you'll want to follow them. And it's just, which character is it at the moment? Right. <laughs> whose turn is it? Yeah. Whose turn is it? <laughs> you have called yourself a research junkie. Does this mean you actually enjoy your research? <laughs> She said incredulously. Does that mean you actually enjoy <laughs> research? Be honest, hands down. I think it's the best part of being a thriller writer. Nice. If people like to talk to us because they think we're authors and we have a cool job. You know this well, Laura. We type all day. There's not yes. even really a good workday story to share with your family at dinner time. It's like, absolutely I, right. I typed, then I deleted it, then I typed, and I deleted <laughs> it. Then I read it five times. <laughs> Yeah. Then I had some chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so the opportunity to talk to people who have really cool jobs, you know, to go to the body farm, to work with a search mm. and rescue dog canine unit to um, I read an article one day in a magazine about real life tracking in law enforcement and kind of the whole point that everyone thinks we have drones and technology, but you still need old fashioned boots on the ground tracking. I liked it so much. I emailed the guy who wrote it and I was like, can you teach me fugitive tracking? And he did. And it was so much oh, fun. Wow. <laughs> well, I like, um, I like when we're on trips and I use that for research purposes, if I know that I want to set a book someplace. So I suppose I enjoy that when we're traveling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, you open this interview by giving uh, some great writing advice. Now we'll flip it and I'm going to ask, what's the worst piece of writing advice you've ever received or heard? Oh, that's a good one. Jeez. You know, I think when you start out, I still think one of the things that helped me the most was mm -hmm. I just didn't know better and neither did my family. They're actually, my whole family teaches math and engineering. They just thought this was kind of crazy, but harmless or so whatever. Yes, harmless. Me too. There she it's, goes, writing a book again. Yeah. yeah. It was interesting when I joined my first writing group, all of a sudden it's doom and gloom. Oh, this is really hard. Oh, editors don't want new writers. Oh, you'll never get an agent. Oh, the midlist has collapsed. They'll, you will never make it in this business. I mean, you, you got to cut that all out. I mean, all, it was weird because I was already published when I joined these groups and it really, really like to knock the wind out of my sails. It was like mm -hmm. all the reasons we can't succeed in that. There is no way to go about writing a novel, which is isolating enough and challenging enough and, you know, just mind boggling enough being inundated with that kind of negativity. You have to just right. believe you're going to do it. It's going to be great. And if not this book, well, then the next one, that's the one that 10 years that. later will make you an overnight success. <laughs> you know? right. and stay away from the negative voices, right? Yeah. Okay. You mentioned you've been doing this for 30 some years. There must be some tips, tricks, uh, suggestions, advice. What are some of the things you've picked up along the journey? Well, actually that's the best word journey. Mm -hmm. I think like a lot 
of aspiring novelists when I first started out. I was looking to, you know, have it made, you know, to hit the New York Times and then I'd feel like a published author or to be in hardcover and then I'd feel like a published author or sell so many copies and then I'd feel like an author maybe be reviewed in the right publication. At the end of the day, we don't control all, any of that. And what I did discover when my second thriller hit the New York Times list is when I got up the next day to write, it was just as hard as the day before. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, my, my beautiful manuscript had no idea that I was now suddenly successful. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the trick to sanity in this business is we are writers. What we do is write. And that's where our focus needs to be. That's the process we need to be focused thinking about, and if we're enjoying telling a great story, the rest will follow. Okay. Love it. So what does your writing day look like now? Um, I like writing first thing in the morning. I also think you can't think about it too much. Bad things will happen. <laughs> okay. just, you know, just get coffee and get to the computer. And I'll try to get out, you know, so many words, and then I'll take a break late morning, early afternoon. I'm a big hiker, mm -hmm. something outside. And it's, you know, with the help of my two canine assistants, it's often how I think through what I just wrote, kind of figure out, oh yeah, everything I did wrong. Then there's the free revision process later that day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and by end of the day, I'm not good at writing after 3 p.m. for whatever reason, but as you know, in our line of work, there's a lot of business side to all of this too, on yes. social media and web. So all of that kind of stuff, all the miscellaneous stuff. Well, we always ask this question. Are you a plotter or a pantser or a planner or a pantser, depending on which one you like? See, and this is why I love writing conferences because we can debate this passionately <laughs> for the next oh, yeah. days. <laughs> and we have, yeah. <laughs> yeah <exactly. laughs> I always consider it the writing equivalent of taste great, less filling. Like you are what you are <laughs> and, you're, <laughs> and you're committed yeah. to it. But <laughs> I, <love> it. <laughs> I have a pantser. I actually started out plotting because the first few books were too terrifying not to know what I was going to write. Sure. But what I found for me personally, because both work, it's just whatever works for you. My books were more linear because by definition, when I'm plotting, I'm coming up with like a year's worth of good ideas all in that day. So it's really the best ideas I had in one day. So what I like to do now is come up with a crime, do some work with experts. And generally in that process, I start getting a lot of good ideas mm -hmm. and logical steps. You know, investigators need to be smart. But then I kind of just see how it evolves from there. And I never know who did it till the week before deadline. And it is really <laughs> stressful. And maybe that's the part I should work on. <laughs> wow, that's so hard to believe. Seriously? Like you don't know till you get there? I don't. And what I love about it, I feel like, you know, when readers come up and say, I never saw it coming. I'm like, yeah, me neither. <laughs> 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 I can't telegraph what I don't know either. So. <laughs> All right. We mentioned this great book that's uh, most recent. What's what's coming up next? What are you writing next? So I'm working on, oh, I actually just finished the next uh, Frankie Elkin book that'll be out in March of 2024. Still mm -hmm. see you everywhere. It was fun to hear you talk about location, Laura, because last year I had the opportunity to go to this remote atoll in the Pacific called Palmyra. It's not populated at all. There's just a research crew doing ecological reclamation. They're working on repair of coral reefs. And it was so isolated. Like they don't like it if you have your appendix isolated because it'll be three days to get you a medical evac. Oh. It, of course, is the natural place to, to commit murder. I mean, come on. <laughs> it is just begging for it. So that will be the next book. It'll come out in March of next year. Well, that's so topical, too. The coral reefs are, are in the news even now. With the ocean's warming, and they're worried about it in Florida. Anyway, so yeah. It sounds good. I'm intrigued. Sounds terrific. Hey, Lisa, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Oh, thank you so much, William. And we'll see you in just a few weeks in Oklahoma City at RiderCon. I can't wait. Looking forward to it. Thank you. you too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Just a few parting words. Renee, 
you got a new webinar, don't you? Yeah, we've uh, partnered with writingmomentum.com, which of course is one of our partners with WriterCon. And uh, we put together a, uh, a conference prep workshop. So mm -hmm. if you are new to conferences or you just want to uh, refresh on how you can get most prepared, Go to writingmomentum.com. It'll be on that landing page and it's free. Mm -hmm. And it uh, also comes with a PDF of list of things you want to make sure that you are bringing. So mm -hmm. really great resource. That's Yeah, terrific, terrific resource. So check out that and then come to WriterCon and hear more from Lisa Gardner and a host of other successful writers. That's September 1 through 4 which is Labor Day weekend in Oklahoma City. We've got not just Lisa, but in addition to that fantastic keynote speaker, we have uh, dozens of other best-selling authors, a terrific roster of agents, really uh, the biggest and best we've ever had, it includes movie TV agents and books and publishers. And we've got a bunch of author you know, assistants, people who specialize in marketing or publicity or author photographs or whatever you need you know contests manuscript reviews private consultations and a great author photo for free i mean at writercon we do it all so for more information visit our website which is writercon.com all right until next time keep writing and remember you cannot fail if you refuse to quit see you next time